Miles featherston Resch. Uh, as Tara said, uh, this is Miles, and I am Libby. And if you uh, expect us to tell you a little bit about why we have qualifications to stand up here and be creative this morning, you're going to have to wait for it. <laughs> you ready? Hold them up, hold them up, hold them up. There you go. Thank you, everyone, who helped set this up and for giving a six-year-old this opportunity. When we initially wrote this talk for you guys, it was a whole lecture about marine plastics and the evils of plastics in the environment. Like, did you know that plastics never actually go away? They just break down into smaller and smaller plasticky pieces, right? Um, but instead... But, but we decided instead to tell you a story. So this is the sweeping and grand story of how I changed my mind. And for those of you who are married, you know how hard it is to stand up in front of your spouse and a bunch of strangers and talk about how you were wrong and you changed your mind. But we're going to do that today anyway. Um, but don't worry, sort of kids and saving oceans and plastics, they all have a role to play. So, so stick with me here. Today is World Water Day and the 2019 theme is leaving no one behind. So leaving no one behind in this context means that globally, millions of people lack secure access to safe drinking water. And so just think for a minute about how easy it is for you to go to your kitchen tap and get a glass of drinking water, right? Um, and so think about what not being able to have this sort of basic access to life-giving material might mean for you. So leaving no one behind in this context is a very real and very urgent call to actions for these millions of people who don't know what it's like to go to your kitchen sink and get drinking water. This is really about saving lives, enabling communities, and ensuring a sustainable existence for people. That's big stuff at any scale, right? The country scale, the community scale, the household scale, the single child scale. The consequences of inaction here are tangible, visible, and immediate. Water is life. Leave no one behind. But our story starts somewhere else. Neither immediate seeming nor tangible, really. This is the Marianas Trench. It is the deepest and darkest place in the ocean. 36,000 feet deep, right? So you could take Mount Everest, flip it upside down, stuff it in there, and still have room for your carry-on baggage underneath. <laughs> so um, it's so remote, only three people have ever actually seen it with their own eyes in a highly technical submersible. Like, can you imagine the waiver, right, that they signed? Um, one of them was James Cameron, though, and so he can afford uh, the damages. So some of the things you can find here are exploding undersea volcanoes. Giant sea cockroaches. This terrifying thing. And a can. That's right. There is a beer can at the bottom of the deepest, darkest place on Earth, right? And, and beer cans, they do this, right? Like, y'all threw that high school party where you thought you cleaned it up, but your dad found the can in the shrubs. Like, they're sneaky. But <laughs> nevertheless, there is a beer can at the bottom of the deepest trench on Earth. Uh, so at this point, it might be valuable for you to know that I have a 15-year career in marine conservation and advocacy. And what people think this looks like and what this actually looks like are two <laughs> totally different things, right? So I spent my career in meeting rooms like this in these sort of glacial processes of conservation policy and legislation. And this isn't, this isn't for everyone, right? Uh, but to me, there isn't a problem that can't be solved by like good, sound regulations and the actions of government agencies to enforce them. We can tell you briefly with sea turtles. So the Endangered Species Act was passed in 1973, and it says like a bunch of important things. The gist of which is, is there are some populations whose levels have fallen so low they are at risk of extinction, like forever extinction, dodo bird extinction. And this law, instructs federal agencies to bring back these populations to a healthy level. And for sea turtles, they go a lot of places in their 50 years of life. And so there's a number of agencies involved in protecting them, right? So a state agency in the US Fish and Wildlife Service protects sea turtles as they come onto the beach to nest. The eggs, when they're in there for 45 plus days, getting ready to hatch. And then as the hatchlings head off into the water. And in the water, the National Marine Fisheries Service makes sure people don't drown turtles in shrimp trawl nets or catch them in fishing line. So as you can see, 
Oh, and there's a number of groups internationally that work to protect sea turtles in the Caribbean, uh, where people actually harvest their eggs. Um, it's sort of a natural alternative to Viagra, uh, so they say. Um, and they also harvest turtles for things like um, their shells, right? So tortoise shell glasses, that's an actual thing, hawksbill sea turtle shells, um, which they now make out of plastic, so you win some, you lose some. Uh, but so, anyway, you can see there are a lot of rules and regulations that help protect these kinds of creatures and government agencies that enforce them. But in Texas, you can still drive a truck on the beach, so there's work to be done here. Yeah, so you can. In Texas, they still drive trucks over beaches where endangered sea turtles nest, right? So, but this is where marine conservation advocacy comes in, right? So you can go and work with the Texas state agencies and get them to ban this potentially destructive and seemingly unnecessary practice. Um, and this worked in the state of Florida. Bit by bit, conservation advocates worked with legislators to uh, all but ban all driving on the beach in the state of Florida. So like, poof, conservation, right? So. When I see the can in the deep dark ocean, I think of the chain of policy and legislative events that need to happen in order to ban ocean dumping, marine debris, and pollution from here on out. No need to do all that sort of time consuming community organizing and education. But don't we have rules about that ban dumping trash in the ocean? T technically, yes. So why is there a can there? Well, people don't always follow the rules, and there are different rules in different places, and stuff gets into the ocean from a number of different sources, right? Uh, we wash it down our sinks, we flush it down our toilets, it blows in from overfilling trash cans, and we even dump it municipally um, from the sewers. So there's like all kinds of reasons that trash gets into the ocean. need people to do better too? To do things differently? People. So, this is how I changed my mind. It seems that there's a very important and very human aspect to saving oceans. So I went from lobbying the Senator of Texas, Kay Bailey Hutchison, for those of you who need to know, to organizing a zero waste week at a K through eight elementary school in Largo. Which brings us here. Get saving ocean started when I was watching Shark Week with my other mom. I didn't like that people kill sharks and I wanted and I wanted to donate my piggy bank to save them. She did not think thirteen dollars would do much, so we talked about other ways to get money to help. So a number of you probably know this, but starting and running a nonprofit is really hard, right? It's all like rules and taxes and boards and regulations. Uh, and in the end, Miles would just be asking like these people over here for money to give it to these people over here. And it just sort of seemed like an unnecessary middleman while he's also learning to read. <laughs> So I decided to make cool stuff for kids, but made from recycled plastics, and we could make money to give to different people who save the ocean. And just like that, we are tabling events, and we're talking to people about how they can do things differently. And Miles, what did you say when your mom told you the St. Petersburg City Council was going to ban single-use plastic straws? I want to do it, so I wrote a speech and I told them that we should get rid of plastic straws and bags and to think about the earth and the future for kids like me when they make their decision. Standing ovation at the city council meeting, this kid. <laughs> and do you remember what they did? They banned plastic straws. Great, right? 
so some of you know this, but this story takes a darker turn here. So a few weeks ago, a, a committee in the Florida Senate voted to, pass a, to advance a bill that banned the banning of plastic straws. Now, this isn't a new trick for Florida. So San Francisco banned single-use plastic bags some years ago, and our Florida elected officials immediately responded by banning the banning of plastic bags in municipalities. So here we sit at the intersection of my son's like hopeful and youthful one man matters civic engagement and the total and utter failure of my beloved policies and processes. How did you feel when your mom told you that they banned the bans on plastic straws? Pretty shitty. Pretty shitty. <laughs> And so this is the part where we could tell you all the terrible things about what plastics do in our oceans, right? There's lots of trash and there's lots of impacts. So did you know that in Indonesia, they asked some school kids to like visualize and then draw a picture of their coastline and their beaches. And universally, they drew it smothered in trash. Every single child. So that's their everyday reality, right? Is a beach just covered in trash. So there are lots of awful photos that we could show you about what this stuff, what our stuff does in the ocean. We could, but that's not what we choose to do. This is, the, this is about the opportunity that one kid has to make a difference. So there's, a, there's another part to this story about plastics, the part that comes next. So when I worked at Ocean Conservancy, George Leonard and I were asked to come up with like a dashboard by the board of directors. You know, board directors, they love a dashboard, right? On one single sheet, show me how we can just know what we're advancing, conservation policies and all those things. But the organization has a number of different focal areas with vastly different metrics. This is the International Coastal Cleanup counts people, cleanup sites, and pounds of trash removed from the world waterways, for example. The California Marine Life Protection Act team counted the number and the quality of coastal habitats they protected from destructive practices. Uh, the fish conservation program where I worked counted the number of species that recovered from overfishing and could be fished sustainably. So how do you look across these different goals and different metrics to find one thing that talks about success. And I had it, I had it, right? So the thing that we did fell universally into three categories. Advancing good things, preventing bad things from happening, and then keeping the bad thing that was gonna happen anyway from being quite as bad. And that sort of makes the world's worst conservation tagline. But so much of my day was spent in this category, and so much of my time was spent just trying to keep bad things from being quite as bad as they were going to be. But that's the truth. These things have momentum, and the momentum swings both ways. It's like a pendulum, and the trick is that when your side has momentum to push your issue and your idea a little further than you were able to do the last time. So the plastics. The plastics. Just when it seemed that the push to get rid of single-use plastics had some momentum, Florida. Oh, Florida. <laughs> when she heard about Florida's ban of bans, my wife looks across the dinner room table at me, and she says, how can one household make a difference in the face of this? How do we even feel like we have an impact against such powerful adversaries, right? So like our household and, and um, reusable water bottles versus the petroleum industry, it starts to feel a little overwhelming. But then I remembered that on our dashboard, the advancing good things side really never had that much in it because this stuff doesn't happen in one recognizable moment, right? It mounts. One decision. One household. One school. One zero waste creative morning at a time. So did you know that Trader Joe's is gonna ban single use plastics in all of their stores? That's right. Adidas is gonna make their stuff, all of their stuff out of recycled plastics by 2024. Starbucks, McDonald's, Ikea, and so on. 
You see, this is because you can't legislate yourself into or out of sustainability. We are only as good as the choices we make. And to get people to think differently, to think about what the phrase single-use plastic really means, we need all that time-consuming organizing and grassroots education that I was so dismissive of. And since plastics will be with us forever, we can truly afford to leave no one behind in this effort. To finish up the morning, I've, I have brought some things to share. Ready when you are. Toothbrush made from wood, metal straws, paper sandwich bags, metal cups. These are just some of the things from our house that we brought to share with you. And now, since it's show and tell time, we did show you guys are doing tell. So I'm interested in thinking about what kind of creative ways you all have at home that you've replaced single-use plastics with something. So does anyone, does anyone have anything they want to share? Yes. I make my own toothpaste. How? <laughs> That's amazing. Would you like to give her a sticker? I think we should. I think we should. So who else? Yes. Amazing. You give him a sticker? <laughs> Show, tell, and give, I guess. Um, so, maybe, so maybe one more. It's sort of hard to top those. We have a, do, we have a, do we have a miniature volunteer? We have metal cups. You have metal cups? That's terrific. What's on your metal cup? Uh, I love it. Is it for you? Thank you, sir. You're doing great, buddy. We have one more. Oh, let's have it. Uh, instead of saran wrap on um, the leftover food in a dish, put another dish upside down. We could do that. That's easy enough for us. <laughs> do you have a sticker for her? All right. So there are some other things that you can do. In your community, you can organize a beach cleanup. You can start a neighborhood composting program. I bet there's someone here who could help you. Uh, and you could work on saving energy, because that helps all of us. In your kid's school, you could organize a zero waste week. You could apply for grants to become an ocean guardian school, start a recycling program. You can write to your elected officials and the companies that you frequent, and you can tell them that they, too, should care about this. And they will. And. You could turn plastics into hats or shirts or stickers and start a business. Um, totally coincidentally, there's this table over here that has some of these examples if you'd like to visit us later. So uh, let me just close by saying that I spent my career discounting the importance that one person can make to affect change. And a first grader, my first grader reminded me that one kid can make a difference and that we can't afford to leave anyone behind. We need everyone's voice and everyone's action to make this momentum count. Now go out and do something fucking great. There you have it. Can you back? Ready? Hi, um, very good presentation, thank you. Um, I read an article recently saying that all of the stuff that we're recycling, they've stopped really recycling it because other countries where we were sending the recycling has overfilled and they can't take it anymore. So is that true? Or what, uh, what are they yeah. going to do about it? Oh boy, that second one. Maybe I'll let him answer that. <laughs> So we used to send a lot of our uh, things that we recycle to places like China and India. And China said last year that we're not going to take anyone else's garbage anymore. And so that puts a lot of pressure on, on our waste stream management to figure out what to do with that, right? Because for us, 
like I just put mine in the bin and then it's someone else's responsibility, right? I've done my job, I put it in the bin, but it's not, right? Because that has to then go somewhere and someone has to turn it into something that I then will buy, right? It's a, it's a capitalist system. And so the, the trick is, so we would pay China or India to take our recyclables and they would do whatever they do with it. You can um, uh, look it up and see how much of that actually goes on. But, but China said, no, we're the, the, the ones who took the most. So we're not doing it anymore. So now we've got to figure out what to do with that, um, which is why the first thing is reduce, and then reuse, and then recycle, because recycle is really sort of the last option. I read that maybe only 26% of our plastics actually get recycled. The things we put in the bin, not the things that we make. The things we put in the bin only actually ever get recycled. Where does it go? Well, that's, that might be a longer one than we have time for, um, <laughs> because it goes a lot of, a lot of places. Um, and here's a fun fact for you. Plastics, as opposed to cardboard, paper, or glass, can only be recycled one time. So glass can be recycled many times. So that's just something to think about also. I'm full of good news. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, recycling uh, its a sham, you guys. Um, if you have more recycling questions, Callie from Suncoast Compost, she's back there in the reading nook near where Gio lives. Um, she has, he doesn't really live there. <laughs> She has all the answers um, for our area in particular because when you get into the recycling questions, um, it's very area specific as well. So if you live in Pinellas, you want to talk to Kelly because she like spends her weekends at the materials recovery facility, like getting in deep. Okay, who else has a question? Oh, don't make me try. <laughs> Hi, I have heard that yes, plastic get into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces. They're not just in the fish, they're in us. So how do we, I mean, infinitesimal pieces, but it's testable that they're actually in us. We, we are turning into plastic. So do um, you have any ideas of how that can be kind of filtered out? Well, I think if we're plastic, it'll be easier when the robots take over. So it might be OK. Uh, you know, I, I don't. I don't know a ton about like water filtration and how purification works. He he asked me uh, this morning how many plastics are in your water bottle there, and I was like, none, maybe. I don't know. So that's an area that I don't I don't know a ton about. But the the sort of the ma macro plastic, you know, like the six ring beer can holder on the bird. Um, Boy, that's, that's visceral, right? Like, you have a response to that. But the, the real insidious problem is the microplastic. So five millimeters, think pencil eraser, that and smaller, and really much, much smaller. Um, and, you know, things are eating that. We are eating those things. They are in us. And the way, the way to get past that is to stop sending plastics into the ocean. The way to do that is like a whole lifetime of resolution. But as I said, Stuff mounts. We'll get there. But it is uh, tough to think about where all this stuff is. That, I mean, you wouldn't imagine. You would never imagine. You'd never imagine. Shark. Thank you. So you mentioned previously in your presentation about creating zero waste at, at a school teaching them about zero waste. Did you guys actually implement that at the school? And if so, you know, how could we do that in, in our schools? So NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, has a whole, uh, Zero Waste Week is their sponsored activity. They have a whole like curriculum and advice for how to implement this in schools. So I was asked by um, Miles' school in Largo to come talk a little bit about uh, maybe an Earth Day idea. And I was like, day, the Earth gets a week. So I pitched them on this zero waste week idea. And that'll be, um, so Earth Day is on Monday, April 22nd. It'll be that whole week at his school. So coming soon. Um, and I gave them the curriculum materials and some ideas about themes for each day. Um, and so implementation coming soon. Um, I'd be remiss if I said that one of Miles' teachers isn't, she's here today. So she'll be implementing zero waste week, um, hopefully next month. Oh, I'll be at my office. Um, <laughs> so presumably someone will be. I think that's. Do you want to use a camera? No. He won't. He won't. Um, 
but I, that's actually a lovely idea, and I'd love to think about how we might be able to do that and really tell that story. Um, but, but Zero Waste Week was meant to be exportable when they designed it, and so they have all these really easy materials and ideas for things you can do. Um, so at NOAA's, uh, their marine debris page has all this information. This question is for Miles. What's your favorite part of having your own business? <laughs> Probably doing events. He actually really loves to talk to you, maybe just not all of you at one time. <laughs> Does anyone else have a question for Miles or Libby? This is not really a question, it's just more of a comment. Um, I've got a four-year-old, and this is amazing what you're doing, Miles. Uh, it really, as a parent, it gives me hope for my daughter and her future, so thank you so much. Mm -hmm.